Tamu of the Plague, Part 2, Chapter 7. It was Taru who had asked Ria for the interview he refers to in his diary. On that evening, as it happened, just before Taru arrived, the doctor had gazed for some moments at his mother, who was sitting very still in a corner of the dining room. Once her household tasks were over, she spent most of her time in that chair. Her hands folded in her lap. She sat there waiting. Ria wasn't even sure it was for him she waited. However, something always changed in his mother's face when he came in. The silent resignation that a laborious life had given it seemed to light up with a sudden glow. Then she returned to her tranquility. That evening she was gazing out of the window at the now empty street. The street lighting had been reduced by two-thirds, and only at long intervals a lamp cast flickering gleams through the thick darkness of the town. Will they keep to the reduced lighting as long as the plague lasts? Madame Ria asked. I expect so. Let's hope it doesn't last till winter. It would be terribly depressing. Yes, Ria said. He saw his mother's gaze settle on his forehead. He knew that the worry and the overwork of the last few days had scored their traces there. Didn't things go well today? His mother asked. Oh, much as usual. As usual. That was to say the new consignment of serum sent from Paris seemed less effective than the first, and the death rate was rising. It was still impossible to administer for prophylactic, inoc prophylactic inoculations elsewhere than in families already attacked. If its use was to be generalized, very large quantities of the vaccine would have been needed. Most of the buboes refused to burst. It was as if they underwent a seasonal hardening and the victims suffered horribly. During the last 24 hours, there had been two cases of a new form of the epidemic. The plague was becoming pneumonic. On this very day, in the course of a meeting, the much harassed doctors had pressed the prefect. The unfortunate man seemed quite at his wit's end to issue new regulations to prevent contagion being carried from mouth to mouth, as happens in the pneumonic plague. The prefect had done as they wished, but as they, as usual, they were groping more or less in the dark. Looking at his mother, he felt an uprush of a half-forgotten emotion. The love of his boyhood at the sight of her soft brown gaze intent on him. Don't you ever feel alarmed, mother? Oh, at my age, there isn't much left to fear. The days are very long, and now I'm hardly ever at home. I don't mind waiting if I know you're going to come back. And when you aren't here, I think of what you're doing. Have you any news? Yes, if I'm to believe the last telegram, everything's going as well as could be expected. But I know she says that to prevent my worrying. The doorbell rang. The doctor gave his mother a smile and went to open the door. In the dim light on the landing, Taru looked like a big gray bear. Ria gave his visitor a seat facing his desk, while he himself remained standing behind the desk chair. Between them was the only light in the room, a desk lamp. Taru came straight to the point. I know he said that I can talk to you quite frankly. Ria nodded. In a fortnight or a month at most, Taru continued, you'll serve no purpose here. Things will have got out of hand. I agree. The sanitary department is inefficient, understaffed for one thing, and they're worked off your feet. Ria admitted this was so. Well, Taru said, I've heard that the authorities are thinking of a sort of conscription of the population, and all men in good health will be required to help in fighting the plague. Your information was correct. But the authorities are in none too good odor as it is, and the prefect can't make up his mind. If he daren't risk compulsion, why not call for voluntary help? It's been done. The response was poor. It was done through official channels and half-heartedly. What they're short of is imagination. Officialdom can never cope with something really catastrophic. And the remedial measures they think up are hardly adequate for a common cold. 
If we let them carry on like this, they'll soon be dead, and so shall we. That's more than likely, Rio said. I should tell you, however, that they're thinking of using the prisoners in the jails for what we call the heavy work. I'd rather free men were employed. So would I. But might I ask why you feel like that? I loathe the men's being condemned to death. Rhea looked Taru in the eyes. So, what? He asked. It's this I have to say. I've drawn up a plan for voluntary groups of helpers. Get me empowered to try out my plan, and then let's sidetrack officialdom. In any case, the authorities have their hands more than full already. I have friends in many walks of life. They'll form a nucleus to start from. And of course, I'll take part in it myself. I need hardly tell you, Rhea replied, that I accept your suggestion most gladly. One can't have too many helpers, especially in a job like mine under present conditions. I undertake to get your plan approved by the authorities. Anyhow, they have no choice, but Rhea pondered. But I take it you know that work of this kind may prove fatal to the workers. And I feel I should ask you this. Have you weighed the dangers? Taru's gray eyes met the doctor's gaze serenely. What did you think of Panelu's sermon, doctor? The question was asked in a quite ordinary tone, and Rhea answered in the same tone. I've seen too much of hospitals to relish any idea of collective punishment. But as you know, Christians sometimes say that sort of thing without really thinking it. They're better than they seem. However, you think like Panelu that the plague has its good side? It opens men's eyes and forces them to take thought? The doctor tossed his head impatiently. So does every ill that flesh is heir to. What's true of all the evils in the world is true of plague as well. It helps men to rise above themselves. All the same, when you see the misery it brings, you'd need to be a madman or a coward or stone blind to give in tamely to the plague. Rhea had hardly raised his voice at all, but Taru made a slight gesture as if to calm him. He was smiling. Yes. Rhea shrugged his shoulders, but you haven't answered my question yet. Have you weighed the consequences? Taru squared his shoulders against the back of the chair, then moved his head forward into the light. Do you believe in God, doctor? Again, the question was put in an ordinary tone, but this time Rhea took longer to find his answer. No. But what does that really mean? I'm fumbling in the dark, struggling to make something out. But I've long ceased finding that original. Isn't that it, the gulf between Panalu and you? I doubt it. Panalu is a man of learning, a scholar. He hasn't come in contact with death. That's why he can speak with such assurance of truth, with a capital T. But every country priest who visits his parishioners and has heard a man gasping for breath on his deathbed, thinks as I do. He tried to relieve human suffering before trying to point out its excellence. Rhea stood up. His face was now in shadow. Let's drop the subject, he said, as you won't answer. Taru remained seated in his chair. He was smiling again. Suppose I answer with a question. The doctor now smiled too. You like being mysterious, don't you? Yes, fire away. My question's this, said Taru. Why do you yourself show such devotion, considering you don't believe in God? I suspect your answer may help me to mine. His face still in shadow, Rhea said that he'd already answered, that if he believed in an all-powerful God, he would cease curing the sick and leave that to him. But no one in the world believed in a god of that sort. No, not even Panalu, who believed that he believed that he believed in such a god. And this was proved by the fact that no one ever threw himself on providence completely. Anyhow, in this respect, Rhea believed himself to be on the right road, in fighting against creation as he found it. Ah. 
to remark. So that's the idea you have of your profession. More or less, the doctor came back into the light. Taru made a faint whistling noise with his lips and the doctor gazed at him. Yes, you're thinking it calls for pride to feel that way, but I assure you I've no more than the pride that's needed to keep me going. I have no idea what's awaiting me or what will happen when all this ends. For the moment, I know this. There are sick people and they need curing. Later on, perhaps, they'll think things over. And so shall I. But what's wanted now is to make them well. I defend them as best I can, that's all. That's all. Against whom? Rhea turned to the window. A shadow line on the horizon told of the presence of the sea. He was conscious, conscious only of his exhaustion and at the same time was struggling against a sudden irrational impulse to unburden himself a little more to his companion. An eccentric, perhaps, but who he guessed was one of his own kind. Having a notion, Taru, I assure you, I have a notion. When I entered this profession, I did it abstractedly, so to speak, because I had a desire for it, because it meant a career like another, one that young men often aspire to. Perhaps, too, because it was particularly difficult for a workman's son like myself. And then I had to see people die. Do you know that there are some who refuse to die? Have you ever heard a woman scream, never, with her last gasp? Well, I have. And then I saw that I could never get hardened to it. I was young then. And I was outraged by the whole scheme of things, or so I thought. Subsequently, I grew more modest. Only, I've never managed to get used to seeing people die. That's all I know. Yet, after all, Rhea felt silent and s sat down. He felt his mouth dry. After all, Taru prompted softly. After all, the doctor repeated, then hesitated again, fixing his eyes on Taru. It's something that a man of your sort can understand most likely, but since the order of the world is shaped by death, might it be better for God if we refuse to believe in him and struggle with all our might against death without raising our eyes towards the heaven where he sits in silence? Taru nodded. Yes, but your victories will never be last, and that's all. Rhea's face darkened. Yes, I know that. But there's no reason for giving up the struggle. No reason, I agree. Only a now can picture what the claim must mean for you. Yes, a never-ending defeat. Taru stared at the doctor for a moment, then turned and tramped heavily towards the door. Rio followed him and was almost at his side when Taru, who was staring at the floor, suddenly said, Who taught you all this, doctor? The reply came promptly, suffering. Rio opened the door of his surgery and told Taru that he too was going out. He had a patient to visit in the suburbs. Taru suggested they should go together, and he agreed. In the hall, they encountered Madame Rieu, and the doctor introduced Taru to her. A friend of mine, he said. Indeed, said Madame Rieu. I'm very pleased to make your acquaintance. When she left them, Taru turned to gaze after her. On the landing, the doctor pressed a switch to turn on the lights along the stairs, but the stairs remained in darkness. Possibly some new light-saving order had come into force. Really, however, there was no knowing. For some time past, in the streets no less than in private houses, everything had been going out of order. It might be only that the door porter, like nearly everyone in the town, was ceasing to bother about his duties. The doctor had no time to follow up his thoughts. Teru's voice came from behind him. Just one word more, doctor, even if it sounds to you a bit nonsensical. You are perfectly right. The doctor's... The doctor merely gave a little shrug on the scene in the darkness. To tell the truth, all that's outside my range. But you, what do you know about it? Huh? To 
Shiva replied quite coolly. I have little left to learn. Rhea paused in behind him. Teru's foot slipped on a step. He steadied himself by gripping the doctor's shoulder. Do you really imagine you know everything about life? The answer came through the darkness in the same cool, confident tone. Yes. Once in the street, they realized it must be quite late, 11 perhaps. All was silence in the town except for some vague rustlings. An ambulance bell clanged faintly in the distance. They stepped into the car and Rhea started the engine. He must come to the hospital tomorrow, he said, for an injection. But before embarking on this adventure, you'd better know your chances of coming out of it alive. They're one in three. That sort of reckoning doesn't hold water. You know it, doctor, as well as I. A hundred years ago, plague wiped out the entire population of a town in Persia, with one exception. And the sole survivor was precisely the man whose job it was to wash the dead bodies, and who carried on throughout the epidemic. He pulled off his one in three chance, that's all. Rhea had lowered his voice, but you're right, we know next to nothing on the subject. They were entering the suburbs. The headlights lit up and empty streets. The car stopped. Standing in front of it, Rhea asked Taru if he'd like to come in. Taru said yes. A glimmer of light from the sky lit up their faces. Suddenly, Rhea gave a short laugh, and there was much friendliness in it. Out with it, Taru. What on earth prompted you to take a hand in this? I don't know, my, my code of morals, perhaps. Your code of morals, what code, if I may ask? Comprehension. Taru turned toward the house and Rhea did not see his face again until they were in the old asthma patient's room. 